We call this considerations. What are you considering? What do you consider on a daily basis? See, there's so much of us consider things we shouldn't be considering at all. How many know that? How many know, you know, you know there's people that say we can pray without ceasing. How many know there's people that worry without ceasing? You say, I can't pray all the time, but they worry all the time, Amen. So I say that to say we can choose what we're going to think, ponder, consider, and meditate on. You you with me? See, that's right. That's good. I I know there's a few less of us here, but GP, are you with me? Oh, yeah. Come on. You're with me here now. We're going to bust it up here. So let's look at Romans chapter 4, and we'll start about verse 16. This is New King James. We're going to go a little bit to the King James with this too. But see, Abraham... Consider not his own body. How many know that? Abraham was of faith. This was before the law was in effect. So 16 says, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. How many know the two have to work together? I'm believing by faith, but how many know it's got to be God's grace that's working with this thing for any of it to happen? We all used to, back in the days of the faith movement, we made it about our faith. The truth is, God wants our faith to be trusting in the fact that he made you righteous. See, when you have faith to believe that you've been made righteous, getting things aren't hard. Are you with me? That's kind of a lesser use of faith. But it says, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father. As it is written, verse 17, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who, whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist through though they did. Now, I want to just stop there just for a minute and back up. And he says, it is written, I have made you a father of many nations... And this was a guy that had not one child yet. And God called him a father of many nations before any children. Now, does it take faith to believe that? Okay. It goes on here to say, God who gives life to the dead, and that's just not people, that's situations, that's circumstances, that's things you're facing right now. You can speak life to that situation. You can call life into it, no matter what the report's been. And then it goes on here to say, life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Calls those things that be not as though they were. And one of those things that God called was he called you righteous without being righteous. He called Abraham righteous without being righteous. See, so far the church makes righteousness about what you do as as a whole. But Jesus made right, God made righteousness about what his son Jesus did. Jesus made you and qualified you to be righteous so you couldn't take any credit. He wanted Jesus to get all the credit, his son. And so he called you righteous before you did anything right. How many think that's a pretty good deal? See, now, if you can start believing that, you're on the journey to really trust in what God did. He called us righteous before we ever did anything right. So if you start seeing that, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, I mean, you start to get a hold of all the treasures God has. Everything that's in him starts to manifest before you. But if you can't believe you're righteous or your righteousness is by works, you're going to have some problems. Because then you're going to know that God can only bless you when you do something right. And that's a rough deal there. Now, let's read on. It goes on to say here, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that 
He became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. This was a promise God had given him. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. In the deadness of Sarah's womb. So I want you to get this. God promised Abraham and Sarah that they were going to be the father of many nations when they were past being able to have children. Why didn't God pick a couple of younger people that looked like they could bear a child easier? Because God wanted the people to say God had to do this for this to happen. I mean, how do you take an... How many know of, of fathers that are 100 years old and mothers of 90 years old? Anybody met? I, I think maybe in history there might have been some lady that it, in a Guinness book that 69 or right in there maybe had a baby or something. And it, I mean, it's an extreme miracle for it to even happen. But we're talking 100 years old, 90 years old, I believe, is when she had the baby. It isn't going to happen in the natural. A doctor look at you and say, what's wrong with you? What did you even come in here for? What do you mean? Trying to have a baby. But because he believed God, come on, God was able to do what he said. And of course, we know the story where he got a little ahead of God. And Sarah actually told him to go into their nursemaid, come on, <laughs> and have a baby with her. Uh, not a good thing. They call it a baby of the flesh. They did have a baby, but it wasn't God's best. God said, wait on me. How many, did everybody ever get ahead of God? God wasn't moving quick enough, so you decided to, in the flesh, we're going to make this happen here. And that, some people believe that causes a lot of the problems we're still having in the Middle East now because of the baby they had out of their flesh. Come on. God loved them. That's exactly right. So Hagar uh, was even loved. God, even, even though they were sent out into the wilderness to die, God took care of them. Now, let's look a little bit here. So I'm going to read this, and then we're going to go to some things now. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced, and the other version says fully persuaded, that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. And it was therefore accounted to him as righteousness. Now I want to say, I want to look at that scripture there. Abraham was fully persuaded. Somebody say that word, fully persuaded with me. Now if you don't get this one, you're going to miss a lot of things. First of all, for any of this to work, You've got to have a relationship with God. It's got to be out of relationship. It can't be out of you playing Holy Ghost roulette. You know what I mean? Like some people like grab that slot machine. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, give me three cherries, Jesus. Let's get this. No, it's about you having a relationship with God. And as you have a relationship, all these things come out of that. So you're not going to figure out a formula to make this work. But to start with, Abraham had to consider not his own body. He had to consider that his wife wasn't able to have a baby, much less being the age he was to have a baby. They were past it. So how do you consider not? <laughs> what we've got to do is we've got to be able to not ignore the facts. I don't want to sound like we're living in some other world. We can't ignore, But we have to consider what God said and let that be established in your heart to such a degree that that's all you consider. I'm trying to think of some examples here. One being this building. We believe God told us to either sell it or pay it off. Somebody come along and pay it off. And he didn't want us to have debt. Well, in the natural, it's easy to look at all the circumstances. Okay, God, in this area... You know, what, what's the building selling for? How, how's commercial real estate doing? And we look, get with the realtor, and we ask him what he thinks. and all. So I'm not saying that's wrong, but we consider more of the natural facts. We consider all of the things of the world first instead of God said, I, I want to take care of that building. 
So what I had to stop doing, me personally, is stop looking at all the facts. I had to stop seeing all the reasons why maybe commercial property wasn't selling, and I had to trust God who told me I will take care of it. Somebody said God will take care of it. And so when God says I'm going to take care of that, that was the witness to my spirit, I had to back out of it. I am a fixer. I am a person that used to make things happen. And I had to get out of the way. How many of you have had to get out of the way? From you were trying to make things happen. You were trying to get this thing going. So I had to consider not all the factors involved. Well, God, there's an air conditioner not working. How are we going to get by with that? The carpet's got stains on it. God, what are we going to Shut up, Dennis. Consider not all this and consider just what God said or promised. Are you with me? How many people, when you go and get a doctor's report, let's say they said you have cancer, and God's word says, uh, by his stripes, you, not even are, but were healed 2,000 years ago, okay? Now, what do we do? We get on the internet. We've got the internet nowadays, and there's so many things that would talk about the type of cancer you have, treatment for it, the statistics on it, how, how many people survived it at this stage and all this deal, and then we start trying to make decisions. Now, is that uh, Abraham not considering or you not considering that what God promised he is also able to fulfill? Or is that you just filling yourself up with all your options, and then maybe going to God. Are we going to need to call the tow trucks? Did I just get on everybody's toes? What, what, what are we doing here? Do I, here come the tow trucks. I, I'm saying this because if we want to see the kind of miracles that God promised that we get to see the testimonies coming out, we're going to have to consider not those other things and consider what God said until we are fully persuaded. See, and you get fully persuaded by considering God's word only. Now, now, don't take me wrong. Don't say that I don't hear what somebody says, or this is what the doctor told me, or this is what the facts are. But the truth is, I have got to get myself to where my heart is fully persuaded. If you're to take an impossible situation about God creating a whole race of people from a guy that's 100 years old and his wife 90, you can't look at those facts or you're never going to see it happen. So what God did was he persuaded Abraham. And he did it with his sight his, and his imagination. He said, you'll have more descendants than the stars of the heaven. Now, now what's he doing here? At nighttime... He wanted Abraham to meditate, imagine, consider, and see the mass amount of stars. So he said, you know, I'm going to have that many descendants. I haven't had a single baby now, but I'm going to have that many descendants. And then in the daytime, so he wouldn't get mixed up until it was night again, he said, and you're going to have as many descendants as the sand on the seashore. Hey, and I'm walking, his feet are going in it, and he's remembering, yeah, I'm going to have this many descendants. There's going to be so many. Because he's got to bring Abraham's imagination and heart to this place that he is fully persuaded that what God had promised, he is also able to fulfill. Is anybody hearing me here? I'm saying to you, if you are believing God for the promises of his word, and you do not persuade his heart... If you do not persuade your heart of what he's promised you, you probably won't see it. And it's God's already done it. I said God's already done it. See, the things that God has done, he did 2,000 years ago. It's finished. It's completed. Okay, I'm going I'm to probably move this ahead, that picture of that lady at the end, Karen, with the hair, because I'm wanting to do this with this story. See this lady here? She was a lady that 11 years ago had, is it called... Greg, anapecia? Anna, Anna what? Alopecia. Close enough. <laughs> she had no hair anywhere on her body. No eyelashes. No, I mean, no hair anywhere on her body. The doctor says, this is probably something that's incurable. There's nothing you can do for this. 
And she chose to believe God's word. She started receiving from Andrew's ministry. She got a hold of a teaching called You Already Got It. And it's got a picture of a dog chasing its tail. Because the dog's already got its tail. Have you ever seen a dog chase its tail? It's already got it, but it's trying to get it, see? You already got it. And so she got a revelation. She persuaded her heart that she already had it. Not that she was trying to get God to do anything or talk God into doing anything. God was already persuaded by his son, Jesus. So she, she got persuaded to a place. And when she got up to give this testimony, she was bold as 10 acres of Texas horseradish. I'm, I mean, you hearing me? She was bold. She said, I didn't have to get it. I already had it. And I got a revelation of that. Her body started growing hair almost immediately. It wasn't because of what any doctor did. It wasn't because of any cream she put on. She immediately started growing hair. And I'm, trust me, she's got a full head of hair on her testifying. This is a bold woman now. But it would not have happened if she hadn't got her heart fully persuaded of what God said he would do, he would do. See, we look at, I believe it was Mark chapter, is it? Mark chapter 9, we, where the demon-possessed boy was. Is that right, Karen? I'm not pulling that scripture up. Yeah, Mark chapter 9, around verse 20 to 22. Uh, there was a man that had a demon-possessed boy. And Jesus went there, and this boy started manifesting. Now, our bodies and minds are trained to look at what we see first and judge from what we're seeing. So this, ah, yeah, the boy's manifesting on the ground, throws himself into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. And he asked the father, he said, he said how long has this been happening? He said, from a child. But this guy had been watching his son with a demon manifesting for a long time. And he said, can you help us? And Jesus said, all things are possible when I get in the right mood. Is that what he said? What? What did he say? All things are possible if you can believe. And the guy got serious and he cried and he said, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief. See, he was being real. I've got a lot of unbelief. I've been watching this for a long time. And of course, Jesus then he wasn't looking at the demon. He wasn't being distracted by that. He was wanting to get to the root of the problem, which was unbelief. And then, he, of course, cast the demon out of the boy. And then, as they were walking away, he said to the disciples, because the disciples couldn't cast it out. And Jesus said, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And so, oh, we start praying and fasting, trying to talk God into it. No, that's not what he meant. He said, this kind, not demon, this kind of unbelief, over a long period of time, comes out through you hanging out with me and fasting, separating yourself to persuade your heart. Are you with me? Because you've had your heart persuaded for so long because you've seen these circumstances that now you've got to start this process of dealing with your own heart, changing your belief system, yes. that all things are possible if you believe. Jesus, the only qualification he put on his miracles happening was that you believe. I mean, all you do is believe. Well, many of us have, I don't want to say anti-believe, but you've believed the wrong thing for so long, it's become the stronghold that's hindering you from receiving everything God has for you. Is anybody with me here today? See, I never fully got a revelation. I was begging God on the outside. Oh, Jesus, please, God, would you help me with these problems, with these bills? There's people in Africa, India, Asia, starving, plead with God every day. And God is not needing somebody to plead with him. He loves you. He wants to see you. But God is wanting you to believe him. So our job is to help people understand that the work's been finished and not persuade God. How many know God hasn't, doesn't need to be persuaded anymore? God needs to be believed. And that believing is on your side. Uh-oh, you putting responsibility on me, Pastor. Oh, my God. People are weak. He told me I had to believe today. I'm saying this is the way God set this up. 
And if I can persuade my heart that all things are possible, I, I mean, just being around Andrew. Andrew, when he first started, had this little building in Manitou Springs that looked like an old Taco, Taco Bell. I mean, the thing was just this little building that he started his ministry out of giving things. He was so poor he couldn't pay attention. Amen? He had to believe God for miracles, man, and people would supernaturally come by and just drop food off at his front door just to keep starving. But once he got a hold of the truth, he wasn't changing. You know, it's Psalm 78, 41, is it, Denise? He said, they limited the Holy One of Israel through their unbelief. God has no limits. We are the one that limits him. God told Andrew, you're going to have one of the biggest ministries in the world. But he didn't really believe it. Here he is trying to find enough to feed his wife. Here he is just making these little cassette tapes and passing it out. And now they're one of the biggest ministries in the world. Because he stopped limiting God through his unbelief. You know, something he said on here that I want to make a point of, because I, he shared this at one of the meetings that he had. He said, before I do anything, I get it in here. Before I start telling everybody about it, I meditate, pray, imagine, until I see that, and then I start walking in it. What if you needed a healing and you spent your prayer time seeing yourself healthy. Things you used to do, play golf, play tennis, whatever it was you do. What if you started imagining, seeing, pondering, considering, seeing yourself doing that? See, what you've done is you're changing the belief of what you have over to what God has promised you. Abraham had to believe God for millions upon millions of children he really didn't have to believe God. That was God's deal. He just believed him for one. Amen? This is impossible to have, and yet he believed beyond hope that this could happen. Is anybody hearing me today? Because I'm trying to challenge you that we can have all that God has promised us if we will persuade our heart. But I found that most people don't want to take the time to persuade their heart. And we've got to take the time to do that on a daily basis. Hebrews 10.35, cast not away your confidence. It has great recompense of reward. So if you keep your confidence, you cannot help, he cannot help but to reward you. How many here, we all grew up differently, and our parents would promise us stuff. Sometimes they wouldn't come through, sometimes they would. But when you were a little kid, you pretty much believed what they said. My dad told me he was going to bring me something. I was on the curb, looking down the street, waiting for his car to pull around the corner. I was waiting for it. Where's that picture of those little boy at the ball game? Now, if you see a little boy at a ball game, and he's got a glove on, standing there right at the edge right there, tell me what he's doing. He's waiting for a ball to come his way. Come on, man. He's in expectation that I'm going to get a ball, man. He's, he's imagined it before. He's seeing, and he probably catches in his sleep. Come on, to, to see this thing happen, to catch a ball at a big game like that. And we've got to be like that little boy. We've got to start expecting that these things that God has promised are going to start happening. We've got to be waiting there by that edge of that fence with our glove on. Okay, it's coming, Lord. It's coming. I'm, I'm standing right here. I'm waiting for this thing to happen. Now, I'm going to throw something weird at you. Don't, don't freak out. Uh, there was a guy, and he was believing, and I can't remember this type of car, but it was like a real nice car like uh, this, this Mercedes. And he was believing for it. He saw himself driving it. He would even get in the car and shift one of them just to believe in for a car. And so they were at this auction, and this, this nice Mercedes came up. And they were having this auction, and the guy was there that was been believing God for a car like this. And the auction was going. The price on the car wasn't going to what this guy sold it for. So this guy was bidding, you know, like up, up to 50000 This guy thought the car was worth much more than that. And so when this guy had this bid of 50000 the owner of the car said, 
before I'm going to let it go for that, I'll give it to this guy right here. And he gave it to the guy that had been bleeding for that car. Now, I, I don't know how all that works exactly, but this guy had persuaded his heart and saw himself driving this car, and it can't help the way God set this earth up that you start becoming magnetic. Somebody say magnetic. And you start drawing the things that you're believing towards you. I'm not begging. I'm not pleading. God said all things are possible if I believe. So God, I see myself. Now you have to deal with your motives sometimes. Sometimes we get our motives getting a little bit out there. But deal with my motives. What do I want this car for? I mean, God wants you to be blessed. Do you know that? Sometimes we've got to deal with our motives. But I'm just saying all things are possible if we believe. And I want you to understand it. Let me, let me look at a few more scriptures. Joshua 1, 7, and 8. Be strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do all that's in the law. Of course, we've got the word now. The law is passed, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from the, to the right or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whatsoever thou goest. Now, how many want to prosper wherever you go? A couple of you, okay. See, and this is, tell, this is telling us what we need to do, because God said this in the Old Testament as well. He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it therein day and night. Now, what God, what God do with Abraham? He showed him the stars. He showed him the sand. So he's saying day and night, if you're going to, Receive the promise I had, you're going to have to do some things to keep you from letting the circumstances of situations change your heart. How many know along the way when you're believing God, stuff shows up to try to talk you out of believing that way? Circumstances happen in life, in your business, to try to get you to quit and give up. How many know the enemy, it says in Mark chapter 4, it says, persecution and affliction comes for the word's sake. The enemy is trying to throw stuff at you because he does not want the word getting established in your heart. Because once you get the word established in your heart, you're going to do some damage to his kingdom. You're going to cause the kingdom of God to grow. Now, let me finish here. It says, For then you shall make your way prosperous. Anybody want a prosperous way? And then shall have good success. So what he's saying the secret is to, is to meditate on his word day and night. We have a relationship with God. His word is being put in me day and night. Bill was telling me, he, while the family's watching TV, he listens to the Bible. Now, I know he watches TV sometimes. Don't let him over-spiritualize you there. But he is putting the word in him all the time. So it comes out. So when he talks, that's all he's saying. The word keeps coming out of him. Now, I didn't ask the other family their side of the story, so I'm sure it's a different deal than what he's saying. But your meditation determines your prosperous success. What's the difference between people that are just into Zen and that kind of meditation? What's the difference? Well, the difference is a relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords. The difference is knowing God. And you know, those principles sometimes work. Are you hearing me? There are people that believe about meditation. But meditation is when me and God are having communion and I'm hanging out with him and he's showing me what he's called me to do and I meditate on that until I see it happen on the inside and it can't help not but happen on the outside. Are you with me? A couple of you say, yeah, we're with you, Pastor. We're, we're standing. Come on. Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. And these word which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. So it starts with his words being in my heart. How many are putting his word in his heart? I mean, that should be dominant. That should be the thing that just, his words manifest. And thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sits in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand. Remember those, what would Jesus do, bracelets? Come on. And thou shalt put them as frontlets between your eyes. 
So we're talking about you should have the word on your glasses? Come on. <laughs> yeah, that phylactery, right? And then write them on the post of your house and on your gates. And it shall be the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which thou swear unto your fathers and to Abraham. Now I want you to get a hold of this. God had promised this land, the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey to the Israelites. The first group wouldn't believe God, so they didn't get to go in. But the next generation, they were told to do this. So if they were going to get in there, God knew that they needed to be meditating on his promises of his word day and night when you go in, when you come out. Put them on the mirror if you need to see them. Come on. Put them on the gate. Put them on the door. I mean, everywhere, everything you do, when you rise up, when you go to bed, you're putting the word in your heart. Because for them to get the promised land, he knew he had to get their heart fully persuaded of his promises. If it was important to these people so they could walk in that land of milk and honey, is it important to us? How many would be challenged to put the word first and in that place in your heart that all things would be possible. Anybody, you got one guy back there. Okay, two, come on. I, I, you know, we say this, we take this like this is something we hear all the time, but I'm challenging you. Andrew, everything that he has built, and this was a country bumpkin from Texas, man. Andrew Walmack. How many have ever thought they would listen to that voice and believe what he had to say? But the very fact that he was a country bumpkin, he admits, he goes, I'm not smart enough to do all this that I've got. It had to be God. His own mother said, this has to be God. You couldn't have done this, Andy. <laughs> it's good to know that you can't do it. Because if you jump into your ability or your smartness, you really say, God, I don't need your help. I don't got this. God, you got this. And you want to work it through me. Will I put your word in my heart? Let, let me read this last part here. And it says... Uh, this consider the Lord's report <laughs> to make all decisions. In the song, these were some lyrics from a song we used to sing. Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? Come on, I'm breaking it down here. We shall believe the report of the Lord. And what's his report? His report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His report says, I am free. His report says, victory. Whose report will you believe? Come on, everybody. We shall believe the report of the Lord. Whose report shall you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And his report says, his report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His report says, I am free. His report says, victory. Now, isn't it good to put those in a song? Because if you sing it, you start getting it. You know, I break it into a rap. Yo, yo, his report says, I am free. I am healed. Break it down. See, well, however you receive it, get that word in a song if you have to until it gets on the inside of you. But for the people of the Bible as well as us, they had to get their hearts fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded that what God had promised he is also able to fulfill? And I'll say this. Your actions show whether you believe it or not. You're a single woman, and you're believing for a husband. Your actions show if you really believe God or you're trying to make something happen. See, if we got a hold hanging out with God, like that last song that we sang, he's looking at us, there is none like you. How many really believe God's saying that? There is none like you. And when you start seeing yourself as God's precious possession, when you start seeing yourself as God loving you and you're hanging out with him, all of a sudden you start getting a whole lot more attractive. 
you start seeing yourself as God sees you. You don't need another person to give you approval to say who you are because God has already shown his approval to you, your daddy. Are you with me? And see, and as that starts happening with him, all of a sudden, the person that God's called me to be with starts manifesting out here because you don't want any of those clods, amen? Remember that game, Mystery Date, and you'd pick the card and you'd get the dud, you know, remember that guy on the dud, and then they'd have the guy and the nice tuxedo would come out, you know? See, you become magnetic to what you believe. And you don't need any more no accounts in your life. Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You need who God has called you to be with. If it's about business, man, come on. You start seeing yourself prospering in business. And if it takes a while, it might take a while because you didn't have enough money to pay attention when you were young. Amen? And so now you've got to change this whole deal. How many have ever heard that saying, when you were so broke you couldn't pay attention, right? Now, no. Even though some of those things tried to come at me from my parents a long time, this is who I am now. All things are possible. I see myself having the best. I see myself, and, and I've got to shy away from those tendencies to want to go with the rest instead of God's best. How many have to do that every once in a while? We tend to settle. What was that commercial, that c- cable commercial? We're settlers. Remember, and they settled for cable. Remember, we're not settlers. Are you with me? We're king's kids. Are, are you with me? So I'm going to have you all stand up now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I thank you for your word. I do want to show one picture, Karen, if you'd show that last picture. This is actually a 14-year-old boy. Of course, he's bigger than both of us. I don't know what he's standing on. We were in Dean Melton's church ministering uh, 15 years ago. And I was walking around. I had words of knowledge, prophecy for people. And there was a lady on the back row. I had a word for her husband. And then I had a word for her. And I said, you had a loss in your life. And the whole place started crying and and going crazy. And I said, God wants to give you a child. The place went wild, man. And I'm thinking, what did I do? What did I say? A week before that, two weeks maybe, she had lost she, she had to have in vitro fertilization because they couldn't have any more babies. She got the in vitro. They had twins. And one died. Pre, there were preemies. And a couple days, uh, one died coming out pretty much. The baby would live for just a little bit, a few hours and died. And then the other died a couple days later. So brokenhearted. Uh, two days before this conference that we came to, they had the funeral for these babies. Devastated. So to come in and say, God is going to restore to you a son, me not knowing anything, I'm not giving me any credit. It takes a lot of guts to tell some lady she's going to have a baby. I'm thinking, is she she too old to have a baby? What's the story here? You know, the enemy uses, tries to stop you from saying what God says. And you end up take. you know, I figure, well, I'm out of here tomorrow. I'll just go ahead and say it, you know. I'm, I'm just, we can be honest, can't we? So I said that to her, and the place goes nuts, and I don't know why. So they told me this story of what had happened to her. Twins just died, a, you know, less than a week ago. So I didn't know anything about this. We get down there, and the lady we're staying with, her son is married to this, this the, she's the brother of this person. She's the sister of this person. And she tells me about her brother. And I said, what do you mean your brother? He says, years ago, you prayed for my mother. You said she'd have a son. So at this conference, I got to meet this guy. I got to pray for this guy. And here's the kicker to this whole thing. She had him naturally. She a lady that couldn't have a baby. She had him naturally. He came out and had this thing. So, Father, I just thank you for this group of people. I pray that all things are possible to them. God, they're ready to trust you again. Hope's being built up in them. They're ready to trust you that all things are possible. God, I'm praying for this group of people that they're able to see your word is true for them that they're ready to meditate, ponder, consider your word until they are fully persuaded. Is everybody in agreement with that? They're ready where they haven't trusted you, where bad things have happened. God, they're ready to shuck that and say, no, God, I'm ready to trust you again. Yeah, yes, that's me, Jesus. That's right. Father, I just thank you that we're releasing the fire in them. We're releasing them, God, to say, I'm ready to trust you and I'm going for it. 
I can have what you say I can have. Everybody say that with me. God, I can have what you say I have. And I choose this week to start persuading my heart towards it. In Jesus' name.